sure you are aware that the first thing that God started with was creating a family. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, we were introduced to how God began to walk on the earth and he created the family, what we could also call the body, the body of water, the body of the earth, the body of this, the body of that. And in Genesis chapter 2, when God was done creating what we could call the bodies or the families, the supporting system that will support the new creation called man, then God went ahead to create man. Now, God did not start with so much people that could be left to cater for themselves, take care of themselves. God began with a family. So, the Bible says God made man in his own image. And later on, the Bible says it wasn't good for a man to be alone. And so, God made a suitable helpmate for that man. And eventually, God gave the man and the woman children. So, what we could call a wholesome family began in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And it's important for us to understand that. So, we could be billions of people in the world today. We can still be traced back to that family. And I'm sure you understand that for every creation of God, for every creature of God, there is that requisite family support system that is established by God to support growth, to support life, and to make the creation of God to thrive wherever God has planted it. So as it is for every creation of God, whether you call it the heavenly bodies of creation of God, or you call it the sea creatures of God, or whatever you could call it, there is a family support system that is built by God to support their expansion and their growth. And in this message, I'll be sharing the wisdom of God for us so that we can understand the church and how we as a people can benefit from what God has established in the church. So let's go into it. So when, when we talk about the church, the first thing that we must remember about the church is it is the body of Christ. There was not mention of the church until Christ came. Eventually, Jesus said to his disciples, I will build my church. And we mustn't forget that every time we mention church, in the true sense of it, we are talking about a body or the body of Christ. This is part of Christ, the physical manifestation of Christ upon the earth. So, Christ is spirit. And if you must see the spirit on the head, then you must find that spirit in the church. And that is the essence of the church. Do you understand? So for us to understand the church, I will be going through a couple of points. The first thing I want to mention is that the church is a body. The church is a body. I always started by saying the body is that of Christ. The church is the body of Christ Jesus. So in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and from verse 12 to verse 14, the Bible says something. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And this is important for us to understand as we understand the church. The church is a body and it is the body of Christ. And you must understand that even though as we all have our bodies, our bodies are made up of many members. Even though these members are many, they are also one body. So you could call them by their parts name or you could refer to them as the body. Do we understand that? So the church is the body of Christ. It's possible that there are many denominations. It's possible there are many divisions. It's possible there are many uni. It's possible there are many countries that form the body. We mustn't forget we are united in Christ. And from that scripture that we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 12 to verse 14, it's important we understand that there is unity in diversity, even though there, we are many, we have different kinds and different origins, so to say, different races, different perspectives. We are one. So we are expected to be united. And if we look at the composition of a typical human body, you know 
that it doesn't matter the capacity or the competence of any part of our bodies, they can hardly survive without the other. So there is interdependence in the body. And we mustn't forget that when we are talking about the church, there is one baptism. We can say there is a shared baptism and one spirit. So we go through similar experiences. This is what God is expecting that you are in a different path. Let's take, for instance, that uh, you want to take your bath early in the morning. So it doesn't matter whether you are, the path is the eye or the air or the leg. As long as you put your body, your entire body under the shower or you pour water on your head, it means the entire body will be subjected to the same water. So if the temperature of the water is hot, the entire body will feel the heat. If the temperature of the water is cold, the entire body will feel the cold. And if the water is dirty, if the water is toxic, if the water is acidic, if the water is dangerous, the entire body will feel it. Do we understand that? So it doesn't exempt any part. And that is what we have as a body in Christ, as a body of Christ, as the church. We have shared experiences. I remember that place where the Bible says they were talking about the children of Israel. They were all baptized into Moses. So the baptism of the church is one baptism. The spirit of the church is one spirit. So there is no spirit of the head or spirit of the hand or spirit of the chest or spirit of the stomach. It is one spirit. Moving on from there, I want us to read the book of Acts of Apostles chapter 2 verse 42. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so when we want to understand the church, another important thing that we must understand about the church is the church is expected to be that place where faith is nurtured through teaching and fellowship. You cannot get this that God has put into the family or called the church somewhere else. So if you do not, I'm sure we understand that some people don't actually grow inside elder families. And it shows in the life that they live, in the man, the woman they become in the future. So families ultimately dictate the character and the characteristics of the members of the family outside the family. So you are just like the family that you came out from. If you are a member of the family of Christ Jesus, you are a member of the church, you are expected to be subjected to teaching and fellowship, which is expected to nurture your faith. So it doesn't matter how you became born again. It doesn't matter your experiences, your, your background. It doesn't matter the things you knew or the things you didn't know. As long as you step into the church, as long as you step into the community, into the family, that Christ is the head and the people that are born again like you are members of the body, God has ordained it that through effective teaching of the word of God, through fellowship with one another, you are expected to nurture your faith. So your faith is expected to mature, to grow over time. Look at what that Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued, who are the day? The body of Christ, the members of the family called the church. And the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, doctrine, and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so what happens? is when this takes place in any place, among any people, faith is nurtured. Faith is nurtured. And we must never forget that. So as we move on, if we must maximize the faith nurturing essence of the church, four things are very critical that must be present in any given church, any given moment in the church. The first thing is that there must be apostolic teaching. Apostolic teaching is a sound biblical teaching that provides foundation for understanding the will of God, the purpose of God for his people. I'm sure we understand that when you look at a typical family, imagine a father in the family not being able to pass across to communicate the understanding and the wisdom that he has gained over the years to his children in the family. What do you think becomes of the family what do you think becomes of the future of the children? Your guess is as good as mine. It won't be good. Now, it is expected in a family for the father to step up and share his wisdom with his own children. The same way in the church, 
there must be apostolic teaching that exposes the truth to believers, irrespective of their levels, irrespective of their understanding, making them to know what to do and how to do it. That is essential in every church. As you can see, the Bible says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So the Bible says, do not forsake the company of ourselves, of one another. So if we must nurture the faith of believers, then there must be effective fellowship. It becomes an environment where people are open to share their experiences, their bodies, their victories, and perhaps even their doubts. As the Bible says, iron sharpen irons. So allowing people to share the things they know with those who don't know, the things they have with those who don't have. And in that same scripture, we have breaking of bread and then prayer. So these four things are very essential in making believers to be nurtured in their faith in the church. So the first thing, there must be apostolic teaching, there must be fellowship, there should be breaking of bread and prayers. So when we gather together, we share a means which symbolizes unity and hospitality, reinforcing the bond of our community. So when we gather also, when we meet, we should pray, we connect. You see, one thing that prayer does is that it connects the church of God and unites believers in a common pursuit of God's way. So we share our bodies in the presence of God. We pray together. You see, when we pray together, we stay together. It's very important we understand that. The third thing I would like to share with us towards us understanding the church is that there is encouragement and accountability in the church. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 24 to 25, look at what the Bible says. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exalting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching, exalting, exalting one another. So the church is the place, is the platform, is the opportunity that we have as the family of God in Christ Jesus to encourage ourselves, to become accountable. The Bible says, let us tear up love and good works. How do you do that? It is by being open to one another, being willing to share your experiences with others, not expecting yourself to be vulnerable and ridiculed by others, but to be encouraged by other people. So when we expose, so to see ourselves to ourselves, it is not so that we can take advantage of ourselves, but so that we can encourage ourselves and challenge ourselves for greater works. So the church is for encouragement, is for accountability. So as we meet often, our growth becomes solidified. There's consistency of our growth. Our love for God and for one another does not go cold. Why? We are together. It's a community. It's a community of men and women that encourage themselves and that are accountable to one another. So the fourth thing I would like to mention about the church is that it is for spiritual growth through service and still worship. Now, there's a place I want us to read in 1 Peter chapter 4 from verse 10 to verse 11. Look at what the Bible says. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the church is not just a place for us to learn and fellowship with one another. It's like the orb that God has created to serve all that. So you come in, you bring in your capacity, then you use it to serve, use it to help. You bring out your best, you bring out of your treasures, gifts to benefit other believers, to benefit other people in the community called the church. So from that scripture that we just read in 1 Peter chapter 4, it's important we understand that God has given each one of us gifts to serve others. And God expects us to be faithful, faithful stewards of his gifts in our lives. So what God gives to you 
as a believer, is not meant for you alone. It's meant for the church. It's meant for other people. It's meant for the house of God. And we must remember that what God expects us to do is that we serve his purpose and we serve with purpose. Look at what the Bible says. In the book of Acts of Apostles concerning David, for David, after he had served the will of God, he fell asleep. So we must understand that it's our responsibility as believers to serve with purpose, to serve understanding what the will of the Lord for our lives is, and to serve with the consciousness that we are just stewards. We are mere stewards of the gifts of God. Everything in us that benefits other people is for God's glory. And we must never forget that. So the last thing I would like to mention about the church so that we can wrap up this teaching is that the church has a role in discipleship. The church has a role in discipleship. In fact, for the world to be discipled, God expects the church to play a major role. Now, let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 28 and I will read from verse 19 to verse 20. Matthew 28 19 to 20. See what the Bible says. Go therefore. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples before he left. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The church has a role to play in fulfilling the great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. So it is the responsibility of the church to execute the global mission that God has ordained for the church of Christ to execute. Global mission is the essential component of the responsibility of the church. And another thing we must remember as a responsibility of the church in discipling the world is there is the responsibility to baptize and to teach. Jesus speaking to the disciples says by baptizing them, teaching them. So the church has responsibility to nurture new believers and help them to mature in faith. People don't become adults overnight. People become adults over time in a conducive atmosphere that is called a family. And so if believers, if people that have been invited People that have been born into the family of God by the Holy Spirit are brought into the church. The church has that unique, that special responsibility of nurturing them, baptizing them, teaching them, making them to become one in the spirit with every other member of the church, active of their location. So whether you are in Spain in the church, or you are in Nigeria in the church, or you are in Australia in the church, we must all be baptized into the same spirit into the same Lord. We must be baptized. We must be taught the same truth. So it doesn't matter our denomination, but we should have similar curriculum. That is the essence of what God ordained in the church for the discipleship of the nations. And look at what Jesus said in that verse 20. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So the essence of baptism, the essence of the teaching is that the believers are able to do the things that Jesus has spoken to them to do. So what is the will of God for your life as a believer? It is the responsibility of the church to bring you to that place of obedience where you subject your own will to the will of God. Don't forget what Jesus said. At that moment when he was to be arrested, he said, Lord, oh, I wish this cup can pass over me. And the Bible says he prayed that prayer to a point and he concluded, Lord, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It is the responsibility of the church to usher believers to that realm, that level where each believer is able to say, it's not about my will, it is the will of God. I'm challenging you right now to acknowledge that there is a will of God for your life and it is your responsibility to find it and to do it. Failure to do the will of God will not be an excuse on the day of judgment when it is expected of you to account for your life, account for the resources of God in your life, to account for the grace, to account for the favor that you have received all these years, to account for your good health. You will not say you didn't understand fully your, the will of God for your life. You must have something to show 
for everything that God has done for you. And I pray for you that the grace to fulfill the responsibility that God has laid upon your life comes upon you right now in the name of Jesus. You will not fail God in discipling the nations. You will not forfeit the plan of God. You would walk in understanding of the identity of the church and the purpose of the church. And everything that God expects the church to execute will be executed through us in the name of Jesus. As a generation of the church, don't forget, they say, soja goes, soja comes, but Barak remains the same. The church does not die. The church remains. So there are generations of the past of the church. There are generations of this moment. And there are future generations. My prayer is that our generation will not fail God. Our generation of the church will not be cheated by the devil. Our generation of the church will not exchange our birthright for a morsel of bread or for porridge in the name of Jesus. We will rise up, we will step up, and we will fulfill our destinies. We will become identified with Christ indeed, and we will disciple the nations subjecting the nations into the obedience of the word of Christ, to the will of Christ upon this earth. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Such a great time we've shared together. I'm excited. I believe you've learned something about the church as a disciple, as a place, as a platform that God has created to nurture you and to nurture me, to make us grow. Don't forget, as the family, you know, in the family, you could have relatives, you could have uncles and aunties. That's how the church is. It's a very big family. There are uncles, there are aunties, there are brothers, there are sisters, there are cousins, there are different people we could call. There are people that are very old, there are people that are very young, but it's a big family. Wisdom is shared in the family. Transgenerational blessings are transferred in the family. Graces are imparted and transferred in the family. And that is the will of God. But in the midst of all this, don't lose sight of the ideal purpose of God. It is your growth and my growth. Your fulfillment in destiny and my fulfillment. And I pray that we will not miss out of what God has ordained for the church. Again, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The powers of hell will not prevail against your life, against your family, against your ministry. In Jesus' name, God bless you.